thecouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Leah Follett. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. Join us as we share our family's journeys to good health. You'll find plenty of inspiration, tips and recipe ideas, as well as stories from everyday people who've struggled and overcome health problems and diet challenges in their own families. I'm Jo Witten, author of the blog and book Quirky Cooking, and today I have with me Mary Kelly from Good Mood Food. Hi, Mary. Hi, Jo. How are you doing? I'm good. I've been dying to talk to Mary for a while now um, because she has a fascinating story of healing her family with GAPS and... um, I think whenever I talk about gaps, I actually tell people, you've got to go and look at her site. You've got to go read her story (laughs) Uh, because it's just so fascinating the way that food is so powerful to heal and so powerful to hurt as well. So we have to, you know, know what we're eating and know what what helps and what doesn't. So um, today we will talk about Mary's story and Hopefully you'll find it very inspiring, especially for those of you who have kids with allergies and anaphylactic allergies. And also um, we want to talk a little bit about um, how to handle it, how to cope and what to do when you have family and friends who are totally not on board with what you're doing, with changing your diet, with um, doing this weird gaps thing. (laughs) How do you handle it? What do you, what what can you do to help them understand? And uh, Mary has a great story about that as well. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Mary. No problem. Um, do you want to just give us a little bit of a background about why you began Gaps and how it how it's gone for you and how long you've done it and all that kind of thing? Sorry, my dog's in here and he's barking at an aeroplane. <laughs> Peppy. Oh. You can't chase aeroplanes. <laughs> he wants to be on the podcast. He, he, he does. He's, yeah. he's quite often on the podcast, believe me, <laughs> because he won't leave my side, you see. <laughs> That's <So>. lovely. <laughs> All right. I'll, okay, I'll tell you our story. Okay, um, good. It's, it's fairly epic, so I'll try not to overwhelm with too much detail. But we do like um, to have a good story. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good story. It, it, it started off as a bad story. So yeah. um, I gave birth to Daniel, my son, Um, He's just turned seven yesterday, actually. um, um, We were living in England when I gave birth to him, and he was a big baby. He was seemingly very healthy, um, uh, really um, robust baby, smiled early, made great eye contact, um, very physical child. Um, The problem that we found was at three weeks um, old, he started to vomit. Mm -hmm. And he didn't just uh, vomit like babies spitting up. He... Mm -hmm. um, he would feed from one side of, of my breast and he would vomit um, the entire feed up and it would come out of his nose and <gasps> it would oh. go all over me. And um, oh, how and then I would switch him. Then he'd be fine and I'd switch him to the other side and he'd feed and he'd be okay. Um, but I would, I was so, um, at that stage I was a, a mum of one and um, really determined that everything was okay and, you know, didn't, didn't really want to believe that there was anything wrong. Um, I I did, however, take him once a week to the doctor and was told, no, it's normal for babies to vomit. And I would kind of go, I'm sure it's okay, but he is vomiting an awful lot. And um, Did he vomit after both feeds, like both sides? Strangely enough, no. He would always vomit after the first feed and then and then not, not always after the second. So I, I wasn't sure what was going on. And yeah. I, re- I knew nothing about babies and allergies. And, mm. um, and as far as my husband and I were concerned in our naivety, we, we always just say, but we don't have any allergies, you know, so we yeah. didn't understand the process. And so what, he can't have them. <laughs> yeah, so it, it can't be that. Yeah. Um, it, it, this carried on for a while, and I always wondered why. Um, there were strange things, like my friends gave me um, these breast pads, you know, to stop mm-hmm. you from leaking, and they didn't work. My boobs were always full, and they were always literally it was embarrassing I'd be out and they would just be exploding and it was because my son was feeding it was as if I was feeding twins he was feeding twice as as often yeah because of all the vomiting yeah Mm. Uh, that's just a side it was just something that I'd only realized when I had my second that the amount of milk I produced for that boy anyway so this (laughs) carried on yeah it was could have um uh, the so he he um, we we discovered at three months that he probably had a dairy allergy because um, my mum gave him a little taste of a um, 
of a milkshake and mm. he broke out in a rash all around his mouth. And there were mm. other little clues along the way, but I was definitely head in the sand about this at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was around this time that I also developed postnatal depression, which really mm. didn't help the situation. Yeah. Um, then we had, um, we decided to start solids. He was really hungry by about five months. And then is when we really started to realize the problem, the extent of the problem was um, it didn't matter what we fed him. He'd love it. He just loved to eat food. Mm-hmm. He would cope beautifully the first time and then I'd make a big pot of the food and by the second or third time he would vomit all the food up yeah. and um, so I was trying to figure out which ingredients were I was trying to um, trying to get the doctors who were still in complete denial about the fact mm. that there was anything wrong with this child mm. um, and I just found myself then my own mental health heading into post-traumatic stress issues I actually couldn't find food that the child could eat yeah and, um, now he was starting to lose weight and mm. uh, we were I don't know if you know how awful it is to cook that much food for yeah. a child and you freeze it all and... Then he can't eat it. He can't eat it. And you spent yeah. all that time and you're already exhausted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and already suffering from postnatal yeah. depression. Oh, that yes. would have been dreadful. It was. It was a really, really dreadful time. In fact, it got so bad that um, by the time he was 13 months, he was now... Um, he had a big head and a small body and mm-hmm. we um, uh, we finally, finally got to see an allergist after literally, I think... A, my mother-in-law grabbed a doctor by the coat labels <laughs> and started shaking him and said, you need to send this child to a specialist. We were working with the UK yeah. system. There was a reluctance to, mm, to send I've heard to that. <laughs> yeah. And the problem was you take this child in to see the doctor and he would just smile and coo and he had big blue eyes and Aww. he looked really good. It's fine. You're a worrying mother. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we got that over and over. Oh, and over. you poor thing. And then when we went to the allergist, they um, – they tested him only for two or three things, and he came up as allergic. So they decided to put him to test him on hypoallergenic formulas. At the time, he was on soy formula because he was completely allergic to my milk and to all the food, and there was just nothing we could do. Wow. Um, so they tested him on a hypoallergenic formula, and at the last eleventh hour of the test that we did in the hospital, he had he vomited it all up. And I kind of got this look and said, "Oh, that's not going to work." And they never really rescheduled an appointment. Wow. So it, I, we, it was me as a first time. I'm not quite understanding the extent of the problem. Um, and and they must know, and they should be right. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we <laughs> took the formula. So now we were at a stage where this child really wasn't surviving on much at all. You know, I think mm. he could tolerate rice and um, um, what else? There wasn't much else. There was corn. Mm. Um, and then, anyway, the, the the situation got so dire that we actually made a, a life changing decision to move back to Australia because of our sick child. Because we just felt we needed to be heard by someone. Yeah. Um, we came back here and almost immediately got um, sent to an allergist because um, mm. it was clear that he was heading towards anaphylaxis. Now, um, yeah. my mother touched him and she'd had butter on her hands and he broke out in urticarial hives all over his body. Oh no! He was still vomiting. If somebody would, had eaten nuts and kissed him, he would vomit. He. Oh. If we went into a cafe where they'd cooked eggs, which was every cafe, he mm-hmm. would. So um, we went to see the allergist, and I'll always be very, very grateful for that experience because he was, by the stage, completely failure to thrive. Mm. Um, they found a formula that he could survive on because at this point the, the diagnosis was he can't eat food. There's nothing yeah. <laughs> that he can eat. Well, that's um, helpful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but and devastating. And my oh. mental health was completely falling to pieces. I was very traumatized. Every time I would speak to the allergist, I would have to go and literally sleep for three days to get over it yeah. because it was so traumatic to hear these things that your child yeah. can't eat. So um, when they did his scratch test, the reason they came to this conclusion was they did his scratch test and I think he had 44 tests on each arm and they had to dose him with antihistamine after doing the test because he reacted to every single thing that wow. they tested. Wow. Well, the poor little thing. How old was he by then? So he was about 18 months now yeah. and... Um, the only thing he didn't react to was the ones that people are commonly allergic to is like grass pollen and things oh. like that. Yeah. Well, you can't really eat them. <laughs> exactly. And um, the, 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 yeah, I know. Otherwise, I would have been like putting them out to pasture. <laughs> um, so the, yeah, the, the, the thing as well with the scratch test was um, often they can be double negatives. You know, you, um, it'll come up positive and the child isn't. But I'd tried every single food that we tested mm. and it was coming up that he was clearly allergic to every single food. His blood tests were appalling. Wow. They were just saying he's allergic to every food group. Uh, um, I've, I've since come to understand that the diagnosis that would be applied to him now is called F, FPIs, yes. um, which is food protein intolerance. And um, there are more and more babies being born allergic to everything. Uh, it's a very scary time. Um, mm. 
yeah, to be, you know, to be a mother, to have a yeah. child in that condition. We um, followed the protocol with the um, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital elimination diet. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem that we found and, and why the elimination diet really didn't work for us was twofold. The first one was we ended up having to eliminate all food, obviously. Um, we were able to introduce a few foods, um, rice, corn, um, weird pork, like those pork sausages that you get. Yeah. yeah. You know the weird ones wow. um, um, <laughs> that he could, for strangely enough, he could tolerate, and then any rice products and sugar. So you mm. can imagine this was this child's diet. It was white and it was um, processed. Maybe, yeah, five safe foods that yeah. we built up to. By the age of four, he he maybe had built up to about seven safe foods, um, wow. and still at still drinking uh, this hypoallergenic formula five times a day. So mm. so really surviving on formula and. Um, in the middle of all of this, someone had given me the GAPS book. Yeah. And I read it, and I knew it was true. The minute I read it, I knew it was absolutely mm -hmm. true, and that that was my son. But my mental health was such that Not really. I put that back on the shelf, yeah. and I went, no chance. There mm -hmm. is no chance that I can do that. Um, also in the middle of all of this, my daughter was born, um, not FPIs, but intolerant to many, many things, ex wow. eczema, from a very young age, started showing symptoms of ADHD, which I'm familiar with because it's a familial um, thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, the just distract, distracted eye contact, having to repeat um, mm -hmm. an instruction 10 times and hold her yeah. face and, and just have her frustration shown to you that she couldn't follow these instructions. So yeah. um, she was born by C-section and my son was born vaginally in, um, in England. Mm -hmm. um, so two different births, but two similar outcomes, both very intolerant children. And, mm -hmm. um, but I always thought my daughter was comparis in comparison to my son. I thought, oh, she's fine. She's so much uh, easier. <laughs> so much easier that I, I, I used to put her in the bucket of, no, she's perfectly healthy. Yeah. Um, and Danny was the really, really sick kid. Yeah. Um, um, from the age of four to five, we deteriorated with Danny to such mm -hmm. an extent that we, uh, he was sick the whole time. He, uh, he would pick up every bug that was going around. Um, mm -hmm. He broke his arm twice in the, in the same place. And um, oh. we've since come to understand that his, his, um, his bones were just not strong, you know, from no. just being on a, on a white diet for mm -hmm. so long. Um, these are all things we understand now. Yeah. In <laughs> um at the time, we were told, oh, it's normal, it's normal. But it, it was strange. It was, yeah. it was all, um, not normal. Not normal. Uh, and towards the end of that year, we, he ended up being hospitalized with gastritis, um, which was, you know, terrible in itself. We couldn't hydrate the child. And then we got to the hospital, and the doctors insisted on giving him apple juice to hydrate him. And I was standing there saying, he, he can't really tolerate anything. I don't think he'll tolerate apple juice. And they, were, um, they didn't want to inject him. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want to give him an IV drip because they thought it would be traumatic. So, um, so for I think it must have been eight hours they persisted with the apple juice, mm -hmm. and eventually I had the doctor. My son was now actually slipping in and out of consciousness. Oh, that's so um, scary! Yeah, from reacting to the apple juice and having hypoglycemic reactions on top of everything, and I don't know how you coped. Oh no, I, I didn't. <laughs> I was uh, uh, that yeah. was my worst, probably the worst day of my life. So yeah. that. Um, I remember um, the doctor coming in and just kind of helplessly looking at me and saying, we can't hydrate this child. We're not quite sure what to do. And there was this moment, and I don't believe it was true, but there was this moment where I had this flash of uh, realization that my child was one of those kids that in the olden days he would have died. And, Definitely. Yeah. And this was the kid that could die from something like gastritis because mm -hmm. he was so allergic. And, um, they did manage to rehydrate him. They put an IV in and they just gave plain water, I think was what they did in the end. And, um, and he, he was fine. He was yeah. fine then. Um, then. But that was the moment, that moment where you felt, I felt the strike of lightning where I realized it's time for me to fix this. I can't yeah. keep doing this to the medical world because they don't understand him and they don't know what to do. And she yeah. was standing there helplessly saying, I don't know what to do for this child. I've never seen anything like it. Wow. Um, and I fell to my knees and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed for God to help me to find a way to, to feed my child, to, to save his life really was what I was praying for. Yeah. And, um, we got home that night and my, my husband went straight to the bookshelf and pulled the Gaps book back off them. He said, mm -hmm. you know, let's read this again and maybe it's time, you know. Um, also important to note that at this time I had uh, resolved the, the postnatal depression. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 
So uh, I'd had to go on medication for it, but I was feeling like I had enough safety nets and I was feeling quite strong. I was still quite traumatized by the whole experience. Of course. Yeah. And um, one of those traumatic triggers was the allergist. So we decided, we read the book again, we decided that's what we were going to do. And we took him to the allergist uh, to discuss it with her and and it didn't go well at all. Um, And I I was upset after that appointment because I felt that that door of hope had creaked open again for us. Yeah. And um, I was excited because I thought this would work. And I'd found a forum online that, of these mothers who had, had healed if, if pious children and anaphylactic children and autistic children. And I was, I was starting to get um, hopeful again for the first time in years and years and years. Um, mm. Because really the medical world in all of their best intentions had stolen our hope. They had told me that it was my fault that he was like that. They told me that um, my child would never be normal and why did I insist on him being normal and why did I keep trying to feed him? Why couldn't I just accept him for who he was? All of these things. Um, which well, did they want you to just feed him formula for the rest of his life? Is that I what? Think, yeah, I think that was where we were. <laughs> and, wow. And that's um, the doctrine of the medical world seems to be symptom management, not root cause analysis. Yes. And yeah. I had... I, I believe in root cause analysis. It was the, my industry that I worked in was in IT and root cause analysis. And so I really, um, I remember going to that appointment. I remember um, th- there was another complication. He had been coughing and he coughed up blood the morning. Oh, wow. of And um, we went there and I spoke to her about gaps. And instead of hearing what I was trying to say, that, that I wanted to fix the root cause of this, of the problem, uh, she put him on steroids and, um, and, asthma medication and all of the stuff which was part of the doctrine and the protocol and what they do you know yeah. and, um, and so we we gave him this medicine and he reacted to the medicine of course as he does because he yeah. reacts to everything in such a violent way that has uh, he, he developed candida all oh. the way from his tongue down to his stomach and oh. in my child who'd been in hospital for gastritis now couldn't eat wow. <laughs> couldn't and drink his formula because his tongue was so burning from the candida from um, having Ventolin and, and uh, ready prep. So um, then I got angry. It was mm. good. It was yeah. almost one of those things I needed. I needed to see to happen. one more example mm. of medicine not working for my child. Mm-hmm. And then the mama bear came out and I, yes. put, my, I put my big girl panties on. <laughs> and I, uh, I really started um, – I became kind of like an FBI agent. I just started researching every white yeah. paper that had ever been released about gut health in relation to allergies and specifically allergies and F. pies children and um, mm-hmm. eosinophilic esophagitis, which was another diagnosis that my son had, as well as yeah. sensory processing disorder. And um, we, we, started, um, we started putting broth into his formula. Yep. So just literally a drop at a time because Mm -hmm. he was allergic to meat. So this isn't something that you want to do. He wasn't anaphylactic. He was just uh, very sensitive to all those foods. So he was an anaphylactic to the key ones, you know, the uh, eggs, um, dairy, wheat, uh, and all the nuts, sesame Mm -hmm. seeds. Those were his anaphylaxis. And then Mm -hmm. he was uh, IgE allergic and intolerant to all all other foods. Um, So we we had to go, how how do you, that was the biggest conundrum we had. How do you start feeding a child who who's allergic to food. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that was the conundrum that the doctors, the way the doctors saw it was that you can't. It's impossible, so just forget it. Yeah. That's, yeah, so, yeah, um, that we would be pushing him too hard. And, and I understand that and I respect the opinion, but I'm very happy to say that um, that I was right. Ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's so encouraging to hear that because this is one question I do get a lot from people and I have no idea, you know, it's like we're new to this too, but people say to me, but – my child is allergic to so many things you're supposed to have at the start of GAPS. How in the world can I do GAPS? Yeah, yeah. So I know. this is very yeah. interesting. Well, I had a group of mums who'd been through this before um, mm. that I was on, online, and, and they were literally my GAPS practitioners. They were matriarchs yeah. who'd been doing this for seven years. And, okay. Um, and they were the ones who were giving me advice, and it was advice that I really trusted because they had been through it. And, and the first thing that anyone said to me, and they all agreed, was start him off with drops of broth in his formula. And I was thinking – Will that really help? You know, that's mm. such a tiny amount. Um, we managed to build up quite quickly the broth, actually. We, mm-hmm. he, um, the more we gave him, the more tolerance he, he had for it, which was an unusual experience for us. It just, and it's specific to broth, I think, because broth yeah. um, has those healing enzymes in it, yeah. um, which help to heal the, um, 
the lining of your gut, your gut in particular, the, the, the um, material that your gut is made of responds to broth. It's at a cellular level. It, it rebuilds uh, mm. twice as fast with broth as it would with any other food because of the collagen and the yeah. um, and all the goodness that, that is in the broth. So did and, you do chicken, beef, or whatever? Uh, right. we, the only one he tolerated was lamb. Lamb, okay. Yeah. And, and why is that, do you think? I don't know, but I've since... Uh, heard it, it's a common theme among FPs, F, F pies. I don't know how to say that word. Uh, <laughs> Not <those> kids, yeah. <laughs> that um, lamb seems to be the gentlest on them, and okay. the, I, I don't have any scientific. It's anecdotal, yes. but, um, but certainly, um, and if not lamb, then chicken. Um, so, and did you uh, cook yeah. it? Like it was it a long cooked broth, or did no, you do? So, the- yeah, we had histamine problems. That's what I wondered. Mm. So we cooked it. Literally, it had to be meat that had been cut and frozen immediately and it had to be um, meat that um, we cooked straight from frozen in the pot and we only cooked it for an hour and a half was the longest that we would ever cook it for wow. in the early days and then we had to freeze the broth immediately or eat it immediately so okay. it was there were processes we had to mm. find, had to learn along the way but um, before you knew it so we took three months I gave I gave us three months to see how much broth we could get into him mm-hmm. um, and at the same time, we also found that there was a good children's provider called Gut Pro mm-hmm. that he could tolerate in tiny amounts. Okay. And those those two things, we managed to get into him. And we noticed in a very short space of time that he wasn't reacting to airborne egg anymore. That was yeah. one of the first things that we noticed was because um, this is a child who coughed and vomited every day. Yeah. Um, we were going to cafes and there was no coughing and there was no vomiting. and. Wow. Straight away, I knew. I knew that there was something changing, changing in mm-hmm. him. I mean, this is a child that when it, when he changes, it's obvious. It's mm-hmm. so. Obvious. So we over three month period, we built the broth up to half the formula was was broth. Mm-hmm. So, which must have tasted disgusting. But yeah, he. He's still, yeah. How did you get him to? Well, I guess he got used to it slowly. He would got used to it slowly. That's how. Yeah. So he didn't really know that we. Were, and what we were also doing was we were cooking his rice and broth. Okay. Yeah, so uh, he was eating rice three or four times a day um, and we were cooking that in broth. And um, after three months, um, my beautiful child, he is such a such an old soul, came to me and he was starting to feel better and we talked about doing GAPS intro and I, to be honest, was terrified. So um, I decided I was going to do GAPS intro on my own mm-hmm. just to see how it went, kind of suss it out yeah. and then I was going to bring him along. He came to me the night before I was going to start and crying begged me to take him with <laughs> this poor child he just wanted to feel better and he wanted yeah. to be able to eat like normal children and he wanted to have his big dream was to have Christmas lunch he'd never Aww. had Christmas lunch and um and so he'd always sweet. watched uh, it was just too beautiful it was heartbreaking yeah. because, so we prayed together and we yeah. prayed for quick healing and a quick journey and um we decided he was going to start with me the next day wow. and, um, how old was he then so he was five. Okay. Yeah. And had he been to kindy or anything? He was in kindy, but he'd missed so much of mm. it because he'd been so sick that year. Anyway, I, interestingly enough, I went and spoke to his kindy teachers and I said, this is what we're going to do. And they were completely on board with it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So we, we started him over the holidays yep. so that we could get through the worst of the die off. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then I spoke to them all and I said, this is, so he needs to be eating broths and soups and meatballs and he needs to eat whenever he's hungry and all of these mm-hmm. things that were, you know, hard hard to ask a kindy teacher to, to yeah. child special attention. But they had seen how sick he was and they were yeah. so desperate to help. Um, they did that's sweet. Are really, really supportive. Um, mm. And I don't think that's always the case. No. But I think if you do find a supportive kindy, you just, uh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> you just, well, especially, you know, they'd probably become attached to him and seen how awful he felt and they wanted to help. So that's and they really saw good. how thin he was and, yeah. and bloated tummy. Aww. So the next day we decided, we, were, we started GAPS. Now, you know, there was so much trauma and breathing into paper bags about <laughs> the of starting intro just for, for this child. But, um, oh, that was an, a very important point. What we, what we agreed, uh, agreed with my husband was um, that we would – Put him on intro if he could tolerate at least three or four of the early intro gaps foods. Mm-hmm. So that was our purpose: was giving him the broth and seeing what we could build a tolerance to. And the, one of the first things that he managed to tolerate was uh, carrots um, and butternut, mm-hmm. and then lamb and lamb broth. Uh, so those were the That's four good. ingredients. Can yeah. I just ask when you started him on the broth? 
in his formula, what was in the broth? Just the bones or did you have any vegetables in that? No, no, it was meat and bones. Okay, and just the meat and bones. Okay. Yeah, not even salt or peppercorns. So or, it was just like yeah, yeah. When, you, when you start a really allergic child, that's how you have to do it. Yeah, for sure. You just mm. – and, and it is just as nutritious, the vegetables and flavor. But ah, the, okay. It's all in the – yeah. Cool. And, um, and, and, and we learned such an important lesson about the short-cooked meat stock versus the long-cooked bone. Mm. Broth. Yeah, well, I've only learned that recently. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a trick one because I was making long bone broth for myself and I was Me having too. trouble with it and yeah. um, discovered it's an advanced food. You have yes. to stop short cooked meat stocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is, uh, you're right, it's a lesson. You learn it yeah. and then you can't get one. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, um, so that, that's, that's a, that was an interesting one. Um, mm. So we had these four safe foods and off we went and we started intro and I can't even tell you, my son, from the morning – that we stopped formula, which was the first day of intro. That was a big deal for us to stop. Yeah. Formula. So now we're like, what if he doesn't grow? What if, oh, what if, what if, what if, you know, yeah. all these things wrong. It turned out that while the formula kept him growing, it was making him sick. Yeah. He was probably so allergic. Was, there was stuff in there he was reacting Just to. the sugar that. and the candida feeding mm. that it did. Um, yeah. From the second morning of stopping formula, my son lost this morning cough that he had had since he was a baby. Wow. Or since he'd started the formula, I suppose. He every morning woke up coughing, coughing, coughing. And um, two days into intro and there was no coughing. And my husband and I <laughs> just looked at each other and were like, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. Wow. Um, yeah, so that was, um, that, was, that was a revelation because it meant we were on the right path. Mm. Straight. And uh, we took the formula out and – suddenly the healing came and it came with him. It came so quickly and uh, it was just so remarkable. It was so, um, it was very, very difficult. Those first two weeks were mm. very, very difficult. He he had such strong die-off reactions, um, which is when the bad bacteria in your gut dies and releases toxins, that at one point we were all um, sitting in the spa, we in the uh, hot tub outside and he, he, believed it was full of spiders oh. so there was and we were all freaked out by this and I was thinking this is oh how do you how do you keep going how do you keep going yeah. when it feels like I'm making him so much worse but I had so much support from mothers who had done it before and they all said normal it's normal you have to keep going yeah but you have to make sure you support him with detox um uh, supports like Epsom salt baths we were giving him Epsom salt baths four times a day magnesium wow. on his feet um just anything that we could do to help his liver mm. uh, to get rid of those toxins and his body to get rid of those toxins. Um, uh, he came through it the best out of all of us. Wow. Yeah, he, he really did. He, he had um, days, he had two weeks where he had really dark rings under his eyes and, but he never um, didn't eat where some children won't eat yeah, for I, five days. That's right. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really hard. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, I now understand that when a child doesn't eat for the first five days of gaps and you as a mother are going, this is wrong. A child should mm. eat. They're starving. What the child is actually doing is it's fasting. Right. Um, there's a process with fasting where your body triggers um, out of maintenance mode um, into healing mode. And wow. they They've proven it in many cultures that fasting does that. It helps your body to mm. be a healing uh, body. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. That's exactly. right. I've heard that. Uh, yeah. And even stage one of GAPS is fasting. Even though you, mm. you're having broths and soups and meats cooked in broths, they're so easy to digest that it is as if your body is fasting. Wow. So that's the purpose of it. Um, is to actually trigger that healing mode um, that comes – it's a physiological thing that happens with anybody if you fast. Yeah. And with Danny, um, he, he never did the – he ate um, from the beginning. And then on after about two weeks, he started eating like – I don't know how to explain this – like <laughs> a rugby-playing team. <laughs> Okay. Like my sixteen-year-old. Yes, like a sixteen-year-old, and he. Oh, that's I, scary. It was so, but you, you, you have. But to you must have been so happy. The joy, the joy. Oh. That when I was just shoveling food, and he was in his, I'd go into his bedroom when he was sleeping at night, and he'd be going, "Fatty lamb chops, fatty oh, lamb." Oh, that's so oh. cute. <laughs> Dreaming about fat and meat, and oh, he just craved soup. it. Soup, and uh, there was no way to get enough food into this child. He just ate, and when we had to send him to kindy, the teachers looked exhausted when I was just constantly pulling on their skirts, going, "I'm still hungry, I'm still hungry." And did they have a way to heat things up for him? I just put everything in thermoses. Yeah. And to be honest, he didn't care if it was hot or cold. No. He just, he just wanted he, to eat it. 
Yeah, and we put broth into um, stainless steel thermoses. Yeah. So we got all the toxins, all the plastics out of our lives. And yeah. Everything, and everything was um, as clean as it could be yeah. to give them the best chance of healing. Oh, that's um, amazing. It was so amazing. And then um, very, very early on, we uh, tested on his skin um, egg, eggs uh, yolks, mm-hmm. and uh, he wasn't allergic to egg anymore. Um, wow. He wasn't allergic to almonds anymore. Um, he wasn't allergic to dairy anymore. He could have um, fermented yogurts wow. as long as I made them from raw milk. Interestingly enough, he had he still reacts to pasteurized milk. Okay. To raw milk. So um, it's interesting, it, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> the pre-digested casein in raw milk is obviously just so much better for our guts. Mm. Just, that took me a while to get my head around the whole raw milk thing, but um, <laughs> but when you do, you then you realize the truth of it all the, mm. the, that our food in its natural state. How it's meant to be. Is how it's meant to be and how it's meant to nourish our bodies. And there's a massive difference than seeing in studies all over the world now where <coughs> pasteurized milk causes uh, calcium deficiencies and heart disease. Yeah. Unpasteurized milk solves the problem of, of, Crazy. of those exact things. And you realize complete opposite outcomes from mm. a product people believe is the same and it's not the same. It's yeah. Just, um, so... Just to let you know, we've been on GAPS now for almost two years. November will be two years. Mm -hmm. And um, Danny now has um, no food allergies left other than a few tree nuts. Wow. Yeah. So that's where we got. And we got there quite quickly. And we've learned a lot of other stuff on the way. For example, um, that he was riddled with parasites as well. And um, I don't believe parasites were the root cause of the problem. I believe that a body that has a damaged gut will invite parasites Mm -hmm. into help it mop up heavy metals and toxins. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's just what happens when you've got a broken gut. The the computer that runs the gut is also broken. And -hmm. and so you you are faced with other problems where the body is trying to heal itself, um, but it does so in ways that that wouldn't even happen if you had a gut of steel, like I mentioned. Call it. Um, so, how we, did you deal with the parasites, and, and when did you work all that out? Yeah, so we. Um, I kind of always suspected it because I don't know if you've heard the whole philosophy about full moon and new moon. Um, it sounds my weirdometer, by the way, is broken. So I have, these, <laughs> <laughs> I have these theories now that people get a bit freaked out by, but they're all actually fairly scientific. I so. love that weirdometer. Yeah. I think mine's yeah. broken too. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> That's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, so what we discovered was um, parasites, like they, they um, generally, uh, certainly the parasites that we had, um, they live in the mucus lining in your gut. Mm-hmm. And um, they're pretty dormant throughout the month except around full moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and it must be the, um, the, pull, the pull of the moon. Uh, uh, there's something that happens or it's just the cycle, that, like, like a woman's cycle. Mm-hmm. They come out of the mucus um, lining and they mate. Okay. Now, what that does is... It's just because it, that's a romantic time of the month. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't we all the full moon? <laughs> anyway, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry on. So, unfortunately, what that does is it disrupts neuropathways, which exist in the gut, in order to tell us what our body needs, what we have to eat if we're deficient in vitamin B. Those neuropathways connect to our brain to tell us that we need to eat. Mm-hmm. Now, if these parasites all come out and disrupt these neuropathways, it disrupts our behavior. Mm. So you've heard the term lunatic. Yeah. 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 It's a real thing. <gasps> wow. That's when people's parasites make them crazy. <laughs> they make so – well, I didn't believe it. I, I thought, think, it, I think that's what happens to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> But then I kept a diary. Yeah. And I noticed that my kids were their very worst behaviorally over the new moon and over the full moon. So wow. over the full moon, the parasites mate, and over the new moon, they laid their eggs. Wow. So I suspected that we had a parasite problem, but I couldn't believe it. It was like night and day. It would be just getting towards full moon, and suddenly the kids would become manic yeah. and silly, and they would use those silly childish voices that they normally don't really use anymore, you know, yeah. uh, and everything would become tearful like highly yeah. emotional or, mm-hmm. and often would develop coughs you know yeah. and um and I, you just wouldn't believe it unless you saw it for yourself wow. but it was uh so i knew that there were parasites and then i took them off this was after about a year and a bit on gaps mm-hmm. um 
And I had been delaying even thinking about parasites because if you treat parasites, there has to have been significant healing because the amount of die-off that you yeah. get with parasites is like double the amount with bacteria. Right. They hold on to heavy metals, for example. Mm. Um, if they release that into your system and you haven't healed, it will cause inflammation mm. and can possibly cause organ damage and things. Wow. You, so you really, really don't want to touch parasites until you've done a significant amount of healing already. How long do you think you'd already been on GAPS? Um, well, in the GAPS book, she says after eight months, you could start thinking about treating parasites, but very gently. Mm-hmm. We had been doing GAPS for about 18 months okay. before we started treating them. It was just, we were that wrecked and riddled. Yeah. So um, uh, I went off to, it was such a funny way that we discovered the parasites. Really cool, actually. Uh, <laughs> I, no, actually, I take that back. It wasn't really cool. It was a cool outcome, but it was a very tragic. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. I, yeah, fascinating. I had a miscarriage last oh. And it was devastating. It was really devastating. It was especially devastating because I believed that I'd done so much healing and I didn't understand now. I had the miscarriage. It was fairly early on. And then for the next year and a bit, every time, every month, I felt I was falling pregnant and then losing these babies within a few days. Wow. Uh, They're called chemical pregnancies. I would sometimes test positive, sometimes negative, but every month I would feel pregnant. And as a woman, know that feeling of of mm. those early pregnancy symptoms and I um, so I knew that there was something going wrong with my hormones I wasn't having, getting enough progesterone something like that mm. um, I went off to the doctor just devastated that I couldn't fall pregnant and um, had him test me um, test all my bloods and my, my hormone levels and all that and everything came back normal except my ferritin levels were raised and that means that your body's holding on to iron mm. now um, I had recently been tested for hemochromatosis, which mm-hmm. is where you hold on to too much iron and you have to be bled once a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I'd done that was because my cousin had hemochromatosis. So I knew that I didn't have hemochromatosis, which is one of the only reasons you would have raised ferritin levels. Mm-hmm. Now stay with me. This is interesting stuff. No, no I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> um, so I went away and did some research and found out that if you have an infection, like a bacterial infection, you might have raised ferritin levels. And then I found this random white paper that these guys had researched at Johns Hopkins saying that sometimes if you have parasites, you might have raised ferritin levels. Hmm. So I started to go put the dots together and I thought, I think it's time that we deal with parasites and I think that's what the problem is. I went back to the doctor and I said, please, can you test me for parasites? And he scoffed and he said, nonsense, it won't be parasites. <laughs> well, two days later after doing the test, he called me and he was so excited. <laughs> believe it you've got so many parasites he was excited about that was he <laughs> he was so excited because he'd never heard of the link you know and it was exciting for him because yeah. he was following our journey and he was a really supportive doctor and oh, he couldn't believe the change in my children mm. um, and now to discover parasites so then we took the children in to be tested and my little boy had blastocystis hominis defragilis I think it's called diantamoeba fragilis and giardia wow Three big guys. <laughs> yeah. And Poor so, kid. yeah, I know. And we was, and so then we went on to treat parasites. And we had healed so much, but we definitely had hit a stone wall where we weren't healing anymore. Okay. And there were still symptoms. We, um, I, I, de- I designed this parasite treatment protocol from reading all the gaps information and all the white papers I could, mm. um, where you introduce diatomaceous earth and then mm-hmm. slowly you introduce uh, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a... Um, I don't know how to say that word either. Um, You're doing better than me. (laughs) Brewer's yeast and then you even treat with nystatin, which gets rid of yeast, which feeds parasites. And then you bring in garlic and it's it's, it's a big, long, slow process. You cannot believe the benefits that came. I felt like we all suddenly had this massive breakthrough, Um, especially my son. Suddenly, um, I was tolerating um, things that I couldn't tolerate, like kefir. I had never been able to tolerate kefir without having like mental breakdowns. Mm-hmm. Um, suddenly I could have kefir. I could increase all of those probiotic foods drastically. Mm-hmm. And um, my son was suddenly tolerating much more histamine. You know, he'd always had this limit. You could feed him that much histamine and then he'd start coughing again. No, there was just no coughing. There was no vomiting. There was nothing. <laughs> and it was just, uh, yeah, I really, uh, and then the next month I fell pregnant and I am wow. now 19 weeks pregnant. Woohoo! Yes. I'm so excited. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Completely anecdotally linked to parasites, but I believe there's something in it. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. so fascinating. It is. It is fascinating. And it's exciting. It is. Uh, particularly because my husband 
who was always a bit of a dragging his feet, not quite into this whole gaps thing. Yeah. Wanted to see the evidence before he did it. Yeah. Um, he had Giardia when he was 21. Uh, he went and lived in Chile for a year. Yeah. And he got Giardia. And he was pretty healthy before that, but from that time on, he had he, tr- he was treated with myriads uh, of antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And um, eventually, did Chinese medicine, and that helped to get rid of the symptoms of giardia. But I suspect that he actually never got rid of the giardia, mm-hmm. and that he passed that on to the kids of me. Yeah. Um, as well as me passing on the yeast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I think that actually the parasites have a, were the big final piece in the puzzle not just for us kids, but for my husband. From the age of 28, my husband started to develop adult onset allergies. Mm-hmm. And by the time he was 36, and by the time he, did, he eventually did GAPS, we eventually convinced him that it would work. Mm-hmm. He, he was down with, like Daniel, he could only eat baked meat and wow. steamed vegetables. That was it. Oh, wow. And so that, he went that bad at a later age. Yeah, as, as, an, as wow. an adult. He was perfectly healthy as a child, never had any problems. Hmm. Um, and then... That adult medical trauma mm. um, caused all of caused his gut to just become wrecked, uh, and um, nobody ever tells you to take um, probiotics when you're taking antibiotics. Or mm. if they do, they just say eat some yogurt. They don't tell you yeah. about the um, you know getting the candida under control and all of those things. And so he gradually just um, got worse and worse. Got worse and worse, and probably never got rid of the giardia. And then to see that giardia test come up in my seven year old son. Wow. Stu and I just looked at, at each other and we were like, it's the final piece of the puzzle. It was yeah. just, you know. So my husband's now starting the parasite protocol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this fascinates me that you are, you're, you're a very clever lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just a mama who needed to fix her family. <laughs> That's all. Oh, yeah, but figuring out that parasite treatment, that sounds a bit mind-boggling. Yeah, so, I just pulled the information I had. That's what I did, yeah. Mm. So that for someone who needs to do that, yeah, yeah, how would they even begin? Would they go to a? Is there someone they could go to to get help with that, with the parasite treatment? You know, I wrote it and I've put it up on my website. Okay, the, and you can buy it for two dollars. It's just to help go towards yeah. funding of the site. Yeah. Um, my advice, though, to do a parasite protocol would be to change your diet first. Mm. It really would. Um, I really believe that otherwise you're just going to go into a cycle of treating parasites. Yeah over and over again and just refeeding them and retreating them. Yes, um, and I think that's not healthy enough to keep them away. No, you have to starve them as well. And your gut has to also, you have to be getting your gut back towards that gut of steel Yeah. Uh, so that the computer will work properly and that it won't reintroduce parasites next mm. time you have a, a health crisis. And, um, right. you know, there's so many things you have to do. Like when you take antibiotics, it's so important that – Two hours after you take the antibiotic, you're taking a really strong broad-spectrum probiotic mm-hmm. um, just so that over that two-week period while you're taking antibiotics, the candida doesn't grow out of control. Yeah. If you leave it, then by the time you finish the antibiotics, you're going to be riddled with candida and you're going to have a really, really rough battle getting rid of it. Um, yeah. So there's little things like that that people need to know. Mm. Uh, people need to know what, how to look after their body before they give birth to make sure that their oh, body... That's so yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. And these are things that I... I have real um, belief that it will become mainstream, that there will be it will. This will become better, that now that all of these reports are coming out about how incredibly important our gut bacteria is to our mental health, mm. never mind our physiological health, that the protocols will change and that the doctors will be given this information to give to patients. Yeah. And we'll stop relying on pills and we'll start relying on food again. Yeah. That's my hope. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And... If, uh, could you just, we did mention at the start, we've gotten on to all sorts of, I don't know, more interesting things, but yeah. <laughs> we did mention that we would say something, um, talk a little bit about when you're not supported in your journey. So how did you go with friends and family? Because that oh, was a big gosh, thing. Yeah, yeah, that was that a was... big thing to walk away from what the medical world was telling you and start gaps and take him off the formula. Yeah, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I had um, everyone who loved me. Mm had an opinion on it and of course yeah um and um in the beginning my i think my mum was probably the most supportive out of Mm -hmm. out of all the family members um people weren't openly hostile about it but like my dad for example when we started intro suddenly he was popping around to visit to make sure that my son was okay (laughs) (laughs) and um 
and I had I had many arguments and um I, I lost I lost some friends over yeah. it. Um uh, friends whose livelihoods were invested in food and um and and dietary advice. Mm-hmm. Um which was which was sad but um but I had friends who were saying to me, Why don't you wait till the research comes out? But that might not happen for twenty years. That, well that was my point. And also my <laughs> point was um just because it hasn't been researched doesn't mean it's not true. That's right. I think that's some, something that people fall into, that yeah. if it hasn't been proven by science, it is therefore untrue. So, <laughs> but that's a, those are two very illogical uh, assumptions. You know, yeah. Something can be, we now know that, that um, broth uh, and, and those, those old, old wives' tales, as they like to uh, mm, discuss. The anecdotal things from anecdotes, yeah, thousands the, of years ago. <laughs> demonization of, of old wives' tales and anecdotal evidence is just... Um, destroyed our health it really has um you know how do we keep healthy if not sharing information but um the point is we've gone so far down the science route science route which don't get me wrong i i believe in science i I believe absolutely in it but i do not believe that we have to hang our hats on something being scientifically proved Mm. to be true i believe Mm. we need to put a lot more weight on the words of mothers yeah and what they see and what they understand because um yeah. Mothers, or they know their children intimately, mm-hmm. and um, while sometimes I always believe if somebody says, uh, "My arm fell off and I healed it by drinking broth," okay, <laughs> that's that's an anecdote, and there's one person who's saying it, and perhaps we could dismiss it. But when there are hundreds and thousands of yeah. people with these health recovery stories yeah. that haven't been scientifically proven, I'm willing to go with the anecdotes because that the mountain yeah. of of clinical evidence is there, and um, yeah. and I just think people need to um, to stop stop treating science like a religion. Yes, you know, it's, yeah. it's, part, it's part of the helpful package. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. and there's you know scientists make mistakes, and there's always going to be changes in science. Uh, and and there are, and that's the thing about science is that no one ever apologizes no. <laughs> when they've given us bad advice for the last 40 years about fat. There's been no formal apology. There's no. just been a move to a new way of thinking, you know? That's right. Yeah. So let's just include it in the, in the big package of, yeah. of learn from it. Yeah. Learn from everything we can really. Um, yeah, exactly. But one thing I do want to say was my, my, um, my parents were worried about what we were doing. My mum yeah. um, just, she, they, they, the, the thing that we had going for us was Danny had been that sick. Mm. That everyone knew um, things couldn't get worse, you know. Yeah. And he got so much better so quickly mm. that honestly, that was how we managed to win people over to what yeah. we were doing. It was not necessarily that they would do it themselves, no. but that they they were son, okay with you doing it. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. They stopped hassling mm. us about it, and my son shone such a light just through being healed. Yeah. And. He was no longer a sensory processing disorder kid. He was no longer highly anxious, screaming, yeah. uh, you know, couldn't be hugged. I remember the first time he hugged me and said, it's so nice. He now loves to be kissed all along his hairline, you Aww. know, where <laughs> touch him before. Uh, wow. So, yeah, this is a, Such a child, the child shines the light. And I've noticed that all around me, all my friends and family, my parents have done gaps now. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. My sister drinks broth every day Woo-hoo. and... Um, <laughs> My my mum had amazing healing with um, arthritis with broth um, wow. in her knees, and it turned out she was just so inflamed, and the broth really brings down inflammation. It does, yeah. Um, both um, uh, the uh, many many friends are now drinking broth, eating, making their own sauerkraut, and yeah. drinking kefir, and um, and I see, and that is just the impact of my son. I believe he's just a little shining light. Yeah, he, he the ripple effects of. Mm-hmm. of health and, and, and recovery um, are incredible to watch. It's beautiful. And that's what we found as well. Um, you can argue until you're blue in the face and people will just be angry that you're not going with the mainstream idea. Yes. But when you just say, well, you know, let's just see how this goes and don't argue about it, no. don't even bother. Yeah. Just Just go and quietly do what you need to do and then when they start seeing the difference, they're just so on side. Because they've it's, seen, like, yeah. I know with Isaac, the difference in him is just night and day. Yeah, and you can't deny it. You can't, no, deny, it. You can't no. deny it. And, and my husband was not really on board with GAPS. When, when we started, he was yep. away for three weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and when he came back, he was just like, what is all this soup? He doesn't like soup. Yeah. You know, and it was just like, oh, this is ridiculous and constant eye rolling. But, you know, he sort of, he realized that Isaac was so bad that I was desperate and I was going to try yeah. anything. Yeah, you're the mama bear. I'm yeah. the mama bear and he didn't mess with me. But no. <laughs> he did eye roll a lot. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, well, Mark's um, been started doing it after six months okay. and he's had incredible, his healing's been the slowest of all yeah. of us. But he's, I just think because his gut is longer. Yeah, but exactly sure. the same as your husband was just, mm. Far more concerned about the social side of it. Yes. Yeah. 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 And that was really hard. Um, and you know what? We actually had to sit down and we had to say to each other, we have, we're going to have to be hermits for a while. Yeah. We had to do that. Yeah. That's what you've got to do. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It's a phase. And It is. We're no longer hermits. I was saying yeah. to the kids, you, do, you can't, just can't go to that sleepover for a while. You just can't. Mm. It's too hard. Like, and then after a couple yeah. of months... You know, the thermoses and everything, they were used to it and it was all good and they were fine. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And my my son was, um, when he goes to soccer with another family, they usually stop and get pizza on the way home or he'll go to another friend's place and they'll all have pizza for supper with all the teenagers and he'll just sit there and for a, yeah. and pizza is his most favourite thing in the world. He's 16, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Oh, and, he's doing so well to just... <laughs> Yeah, he just sits there and he said to me, you know, before he'd come home, he'd be like, oh, mom, it was so hard. I had to just sit there and now I'm starving. What can I eat? You know, or else he'd take his thermos of food. But he came home the other day and he said, mom, they were all eating pizza and it didn't even worry me. And I'm just so happy that I'm so well. And, you know, he was just so. Doesn't um, that just mean the world? Yeah, he said he's just happy to eat the food that we're eating and he knows it's helping him to be better. And that's just so encouraging. Yeah, and you know, it's the hardest, it's the hardest on you and I, Joe, because we're the ones who have to, in order that our kids don't feel left out, we're Mm. the ones that when they go to a birthday party, we basically have to cook birthday (laughs) party food. That's right. (laughs) Everywhere they go, we've got to cook what they're going, what everyone else is eating in some, you know, or, or something to Substitute just so, for so it. that they don't feel left out and yeah. you know do what we have to do yeah but but let me tell you that we are now starting to transition off gaps and yep. we're um, we're we're tolerating potatoes perfectly well Woo-hoo. and the sour bread is back on the menu oh that must be exciting my kids it's will so jump exciting. for joy when that happens <laughs> it is. and i'm going to start making sourdough based I've been making almond-based pizzas, but we're going to yeah. make sourdough-based pizzas. Oh, how exciting! We aren't, we're not having it every day. We're having it once a week. Yep. And, um, but the point of gaps is, it's not forever. It's, no, that's, that's, it's the that's most ex- powerful protocol. Yeah, and it ends. It's not an elimination diet, and that was the thing that was so hopeful about it. Yeah, you know? and that's what we actually just talked about in the podcast that I recently did with Fuad Kassab about. Mm-hmm. You know, is it forever? What do you do? You know, my kids would probably have died if I would have said this is forever. But for them to know that there's an end in sight and that we are healing and then you can start to bring some things back in, maybe not as much as you had before, Yeah. a lot more carefully. Like you said, you might only have it once a week. But just the hope of being able to have spelt bread again keeps them going. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, it's um, when I had – I have – I love now that I'm pregnant, you know, it's really funny. <laughs> what are you craving? Oh my gosh. Let me tell you what I'm craving. So <laughs> my first two pregnancies, I craved McDonald's. I was sad diet. I did not yeah. eat good yeah. food at all. Yeah. Um, I had McDonald's and fruit and I got fat. I put on about 25 kilos with each wow. pregnancy. Oh my gosh. It was just um, eat, 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 eat. And um, all sugar based things. So yeah. this pregnancy, for about three or four days, I will crave egg yolks, which sure. I eat, um, organic egg yolks. And then I will And how crave, do you eat them? Uh, I put them in my smoothies or mm-hmm. I just have really soft poached eggs. Yep. So completely against the doctor's orders. <laughs> I eat as much liver pate as I want. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> raw cheeses. Oh, my gosh. But it has to be organic grass yeah. raw cheeses. And then you know that the quality is good. Yeah. Um, uh, so much avocado and oh. guacamole. And these are the things that my body is craving because everything's changed in Your my baby mind. is going to be so smart with all that fat. <laughs> <laughs> so healthy. I'm really so like healthy. Gra- the grand experiment. Will we have a healthy child? <laughs> Feeding the brain there. No, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's wonderful to be empowered as well about food. And I, um, I was talking to one of the, um, the mothers who's also a nutritionist and she was just saying, you know, all the food that they're telling pregnant people not to eat – 
is the food that feeds a baby's brain more than any other food. Isn't that crazy? It's just crazy. But but very important is not just chicken liver pate from the supermarket. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It's probably more yeah. because they're trying to protect people from the rubbish that's out there. Exactly, yeah. Like, yeah. They wouldn't want to eat egg yolks if it was from caged egg. No. That, so as long as you know what your food is eating. Exactly. Then you can you can really take control of what you you nourish yourself with and your family with. Yeah. Isn't it true? It, it is about taking control though, because you can sort of just let life happen and let food happen and just eat whatever there is in the supermarket and you don't question anything. Right, yeah. And your and health is just what it is, and you can't do anything about it. Or there's being proactive and going right. I'm not just going to have whatever food, you know, is the cheapest yeah. or whatever is. Yeah, I'm going to get out there and search for what's the best for my family and I'm going to, like you did, research everything and we're yeah. going to make the best choices and look at the difference it's made. And you know what you do? It's a, it's a matrix. You step out of the matrix and yeah. you're suddenly trapped in this food matrix where adverts um, can actually – I find advertising can't sell me anything anymore because no, I've stepped off from being told what yeah. to do um, and it's so empowering. It's, it is. It's, Socially isolating sometimes, <laughs> but to be able to um, to look at a food and no matter how hard they try and sell you on it by saying it's all natural mm-hmm. and you know, full of fruit, you can look at them and go, "Yeah, right." Oh, yes, <laughs> on you. <laughs> and I'll make my own. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Oh, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I think everybody, you should get over to Mary's website, Good Mood Food. Yep. And also Facebook page, check yep. it out. Um, she has great ideas. You you sort of post the sorts of things you're eating each day, and yeah, kind of and thing. lots of research. I'm posting lots all the new white papers that are coming out so everyone can learn for themselves. That's really helpful because a lot of us, like me, don't really know where to start with that kind of thing. So you sound like um, you've got that together. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> been doing Education. that for a few years. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, I sort of am the type of person that goes, well, I know how to cook for, you know, help people to learn how to cook this way. So I'm yes. happy to share my knowledge there. But the research side of things, I'd rather find someone else who knows what they're doing. <laughs> so I, I am fairly the opposite. Go yeah. see Mary. I'm boring, but I'm good with the research. <laughs> okay, well, I'll send my people over to you for research and you can send them <laughs> we'll to me for something. cooking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. awesome. Well. Thank you so much, Mary, and everybody who's here listening, thank you so much for being around and listening to A Quirky Journey. I hope you found it helpful. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. You can ask on my Facebook page. You can ask on Mary's Facebook page. We also have the wellnesscouch.com website where you can go onto A Quirky Journey and leave comments and questions there. I must admit I see them better if they're on Facebook, though. (laughs) Um, And... Also, check out the other podcasts on the Wellness Couch. There's a lot of information there that you can find from nutritionists, naturopaths, all sorts of people that have a lot of really good information about gut health as well as other things. Um, And if you would like to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, that would be awesome. Give me a five-star rating. (laughs) And um, we'll hopefully see you next week with another great interview from someone who's working on healing their family with food. So thanks again for listening and we hope to be back next week. Bye everybody. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.